In the recent Nintendo Direct, we got a big announcement that more DLC fighters are going to be in development for Smash Ultimate, beyond the characters that were already announced for this game's DLC. So this means that after this fighter pass that we're currently getting characters for is concluded, we're still going to be getting more DLC characters on top of that. But the major question that's now left in Nintendo fans' minds is how many new DLC characters will there be? So in this video, I'm going to be analyzing things like release patterns, what I think is generally realistic for the roster of the game and much more, and determining a theory for how many more DLC fighters we're going to be getting for the game. And by no means am I guaranteed to be 100% accurate with this prediction or anything like that, but I think I'm going to be giving you guys a good idea of what's realistic to expect and some possible scenarios here. In addition to that, I'm also going to be going over some things that I found very significant within the Nintendo Directs that I didn't get a chance to talk about in last week's video, which mainly focused on the significance of Sans and Terry's inclusions in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. So we're cramming that all into one video today, and without further ado, let's get started. So, so far we've had four DLC fighters released for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, three of them as part of the Fighter Pass and the other one being Piranha Plant. We also have one more DLC fighter coming in November which was announced in the recent Nintendo Direct being Terry Bogard from SNK's Fatal Fury series. And there's also one more unannounced character to be included as the final one in the current Fighter Pass. The final character is confirmed to be released by the end of February of next year, so the next wave of DLC will have to be released after that. And for this next wave of DLC, that's been announced to be in development, we are guaranteed more than one fighter for it because they said that more fighters, plural, are in development, so we won't have to worry about the unlikely scenario of just one more DLC fighter coming out. I don't think anybody realistically expected that to happen, I just wanted to point it out. Now before we get a little bit more into how many DLC fighters we're going to get, I think it's very important to look at release dates of previous DLC fighters in order to determine an accurate time frame for the next wave of fighters that'll be coming out. Piranha Plant released on the 1st of February this year, with Joker releasing on April 17th, being the first character for the fighter pass, and this was a little over two months later. Hero released on on July 30th, a little over three months after the release of Joker. Banjo recently released on September the 4th, a little over one month later, and Terry is set to release in November, which will be about two months after Banjo. This means that the average release time between DLC fighters for Smash Ultimate is around two months. This means that we should be expecting the fifth DLC fighter to release around late January to early February, depending on where in November Terry releases. So if this pattern of around one character every two months sticks, and we assume a January release of Terry in 2020, we could have five more DLC fighters release on that pace before the end of the year, with one releasing in March, May, July, September, and November. And that amount of five would be perfect for a new fighter pass, which would probably be the ideal scenario for Nintendo to release in order to make people spend more money on the DLC fighters. Think about it, if there was no fighter pass, would you really be interested in buying Terry Bogard if his moveset doesn't end up being that unique? By Nintendo locking you into that purchase of the fighter pass, sure they take a discount on the price of you buying all five DLC fighters, but they probably make more money than you would have initially spent in the end because you're probably buying more DLC fighters than you would have if there was no fighter pass. Let's say in the end, you would probably only be interested in two DLC fighters at around $7 each. That's $14 you're spending, but Nintendo locking you into that fighter pass makes you spend money on all five DLC fighters. So this amount of five fighters being added in after this current fighter pass concludes, may make some sense. With the end of the potential second wave of DLC fighters being by the end of 2020, this would also align with a two-year DLC lifespan for Smash Ultimate being similar to the one that we got for Smash 4. So there is some evidence pointing to this from the past. Except this time around there would be many more fighters than we got for Smash 4. But there are other options than the five that I suggested. There's many that people have been throwing around. And one likely idea I think is an idea of three characters, because that could potentially make the fighter menu perfectly aligned. But come on, does Nintendo really care about that? I believe that whether or not Nintendo wants to release all of these new fighters in 2020, we will still be getting five more in a new fighter pass. Three is the next most likely option though. I find two DLC fighters is too low, and four is a very bad number because Nintendo can make so much more money by adding a fifth to make it a full-on fighter pass. And anything more than five I think is just unrealistic. In terms of who those fighters will be, I have addressed some ideas in the past, but I will be making another predictions video relatively soon, 
for a new full-on fighter pass. So if you're interested, look out for that. But aside from Super Smash Brothers, the Nintendo Direct did contain a lot of information. But this Direct did generate some controversy, which is something that I want to address. But first off, let me mention some things that I thought were fairly significant that were inside of it. Overwatch was leaked to be coming to the Switch a little while ago, and this was the first thing that Nintendo decided to show off in the Direct. I think it was a really good idea for them to start off with it, because why would you want to go and wait around throughout the entire Direct for something that is already known to the public to be shown off. And I also think it's pretty late for Nintendo to be putting Overwatch on the Switch. I think it should have been done a long time ago, closer to the launch of the system even. But the first thing that I really liked in the Nintendo Direct was the Luigi's Mansion 3 segment. The different hotel floors have really interesting themes, which is always something that's appreciated from a game that's trying to convey an interesting environment. And the new Scream Park party mode looks like a lot of fun. If you haven't checked out the segment in the Direct, I really give it a recommendation. This new multiplayer party mode allows for up to 8 players to contribute in it. I'm sure a lot of fun times could be had with this. Another interesting title shown off in the Nintendo Direct was previously known as Town, but now known as Little Town Hero. And it looks like a ton of fun, with a unique battle system and concept. The OST should be really good too, considering that Toby Fox is composing some of it, and he did a great job with Undertale's OST. Game Freak also have a pretty good track record, in my opinion, they've produced some of my favorite games of all time in the Pokemon series. Another interesting title shown off in the Nintendo Direct was Link's Awakening. This title is releasing relatively soon, but they did manage to show off a really fun, unique feature. And this is the dungeon creator for Link's Awakening. You can create a dungeon and save it to a Legend of Zelda amiibo. And this is sort of like a Zelda maker, which a lot of people have been requesting for top-down Zelda titles. I was wondering what Nintendo was planning on adding to Link's Awakening, because I didn't really think that releasing this game alone as a remake would justify the full-on price point. But with this feature included, and if it's expanded upon enough, the price point could end up being justified here. Pokemon Sword and Shield was something announced before the Nintendo Direct to be shown off, and there were some new Pokemon introduced for it. I think they look very unique and interesting, which is something that I always appreciate from a Pokemon design. But I was surprised at no reveal of the middle stage starter evolutions, as they usually do that in September, but I'm sure we'll see them soon enough. Other updates that were shown after this in the Nintendo Direct include Tetris 99, which has a fun new mode introduced for it, and I'm glad that Nintendo is still updating this fun game. They also showed off new footage of Mario and Sonic at Tokyo 2020, which looks pretty interesting with the Tokyo 1964 mode being added in it, being pixelated versions of some games. From other footage that we've seen in this game, it looks like this mode may be replacing most of the Dream Events, which kind of pisses me off. Dream Events were probably the most fun and unique aspect of the Mario and Sonic games, and if they're being completely stripped out of this one in favor of a pixelated version of some of the games, I don't think that's the best idea. Animal Crossing New Horizons was shown off later on in the Nintendo Directs, and it looks really good. Despite it getting the most time for a single game in this Nintendo Direct, fans still seem to have wanted more of it. But I'm sure we're going to be getting that in either a general Nintendo Direct in January or February, or a completely Animal Crossing focused Direct before its release. Count on one of those two options happening sometime. The big final announcement for this Nintendo Direct was an HD remaster of Xenoblade Chronicles, with it being called the definitive edition of the game. Xenoblade Chronicles is a beloved game to many Nintendo fans, so it's nice to see it being remade. This announcement may not hit home with everybody who is not really a Xenoblade fan, considering that the series doesn't do extreme numbers sales-wise, but with fans of the Xenoblade series, this announcement is resonating very well. Overall, there wasn't too much extreme stuff stuff in this direct, I think that's mainly due to how good E3 was for those big announcements like Breath of the Wild 2 for example, but I really enjoyed it. Because while surprises were somewhat limited, nearly everything I wanted to see that had already been announced was included in it. And it's kinda interesting to have some ambiguity for what Nintendo's big 2020 game is going to be. But because of this lack of big announcements, this direct has been somewhat controversial in the eyes of fans. But if you're interested in my thoughts on what Nintendo's big 2020 game is going to be, I encourage you to check out this video that I have linked on screen focusing exactly on that topic. And if you're interested in other Super Smash Bros. Ultimate content, I have some linked for you on the screen as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.